My name is Rebecca, and I am the director of programs at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Foundation. So I work with Dr. Sackler um, to provide additional programs here at the Center for Feminist Art. Um, and I am absolutely thrilled uh, to be here to welcome um, Dr. Gail Levin as she discusses her new book, which we have right here, we have right here, um, Lee Krasner, a biography. The first full-length account of Krasner's influential and colorful life. Um, and as you can see, there is a book signing um, that will follow, and we're really excited that Dr. Levin has agreed to do that. Um, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, uh, which opened in 2007, is an exhibition and education facility dedicated to the past, present, and future of feminist art. As the permanent home to the iconic work, The Dinner Party by Judy Chicago, the center also strives to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions, to educate new generations about the meaning of feminist art, and to maintain a dynamic and learning facility, um, as well as to present feminism in an approachable and relevant way. Uh, the Feminist Gallery, with uh, the Lorna Simpson exhibition up right now, I hope you have all had a chance to take a look at that. Um, the gallery is only one piece of the puzzle. At its core, the center is a space for discourse, conversation, and the exchange of ideas. Um, so to have Dr. Levin here and have her share her book and research with us is a perfect and lovely fit. Dr. Sackler could not be here today, but she asked me to relay the following message. It is a pleasure and a privilege to have Gail Levin at the Sackler Center today to share her research and insights on Lee Krasner. Unfortunately, an immediate health issue keeps me from being here with you. Gail has been a friend and colleague for more than a decade. Her scholarship on Judy Chicago has added enormously to our understanding of feminist art, the great Judy Chicago, and appreciation for our iconic masterpiece, The Dinner Party. So I couldn't agree more with Dr. Sackler's words. Gail Levin's comprehensive biography weaves her rigorous research and knowledge of the history of art with personal anecdotes to present Krasner as an independent, resourceful, dynamic, intelligent woman and a gifted artist of uncompromising talent and remarkable energy. Levin debunks the previous portrayals that depict Krasner solely as the long-suffering wife of Jackson Pollock and allows Krasner to emerge as a significant artist in her own right, a painter who deserves a place in the 20th century's cultural history and artistic pantheon. Gail Levin is the author of 12 books and is an expert on the lives and work of Edward Hopper and Lee Krasner and Judy Chicago, I would like to add. She is currently a distinguished professor of art history at Baruch College and the Graduate School of the City of New York. She has lectured all over the world, curated exhibits in New York City, Valencia, and Tokyo, and has photographs in public collections in New York and in Georgia. Um, and personally, I'd like to add that she's been a supporter of the Center for Feminist Art since day one, and I'm overjoyed that she's here today to share her scholarship. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Levin. Oh, thank you very much. I don't um, worry, I'm not going to read, but I have maybe teensy something to read. It's such a pleasure to be speaking about Lee Krasner in the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Lee Krasner has can everybody can hear well, right? Lee Krasner has been too long overshadowed by her husband for 14 years, Jackson Pollock. She had another long relationship, 10 year long relationship with a different artist, uh, Igor Pantuhoff, before uh, she was with Jackson Pollock. And she had a long life after his death, um, untimely death at age 44 in 1956. Uh, she lived on until the age of 75 and passed away in 1984. I was privileged to know her, as you see me here with her, in um, front of her 
the house she shared with Pollock in Springs in East Hampton, New York in 1977. I hope you can still recognize me, but <laughs> I was then a young curator at the Whitney Museum. Krasner was really a mentor to me. And I thought that the moment was right for a biography of Krasner, and I think it was, but I have to say that there are still a few old timers around who buy the old male chauvinist line and even some who have said, well, you know, she wasn't an important artist because she was too busy being Jackson Pollock's wife and supporting his career. But there's really no reason that that should take away from her career. She continued to paint and to show. And so some people, art writers, that left Krasner out of the books they published on abstract expressionism, abstract expressionism since, the since 1970, I don't want to give up the ghost um, and let her into the pantheon. But I'd like to open up the canon for many, many more women artists, not just Lee Krasner, and level the playing field. So this is um, kind of ground zero for doing that here at the Sackler Center. So I felt that I wanted to um, really say, you know, how far we've come, but how far we have still to go for women artists. And I, <clears throat> I want to mention, well, I, should, I think I'll share with you that I actually, may, maybe 17 or so years ago, I first just went out to um, Springs on Long Island. I'm from far away, and I'd never been out to eastern Long Island. I went out because um, I met Krasner when I was um, a graduate student, a beginning graduate student in 1971. I was 22. And I, I arranged to have an interview with her at the Marlboro Gallery. And a colleague who recently, uh, a few years ago, edited an article by me about Lee Krasner, she said, how could you have had an interview with Lee Krasner when you're only 22 years old? And I thought, wow, it was easy. She wasn't that famous. I just had a course on abstract expressionism. There were no women artists in the course. This is at Rutgers University, a doctoral course. And uh, the, a new book, the Abstract Expressionism, The Triumph of American Painting, had just come out. There were no women in that book, although Lee Krasner Pollock was acknowledged for giving her copyright permission to reproduce the work of Jackson Pollock. And I had just done a master's thesis the year before on Henry Moore, the British sculptor, whom I had gone to visit and interview. And then I was a year younger, and he was a lot more famous at the time. So this didn't seem like such a big deal to get this interview, but in my research, I, just, I was saying I had it in December 1970, only to find out it was really in January 1971. So it's only off for a couple of weeks. And the letter setting up the interview from the Marlboro Gallery to Lee Krasner is still in Lee Krasner's papers at the Archives of American Art. And I was able to read through all of those papers, which had a lot of goodies for a biographer. And I'm reading one particular long handwritten letter, and I'm, you know, reading it, and suddenly I'm realizing, and I'm reading it, and I realize I wrote this letter. My God. <laughs> she saved absolutely everything. But anyway, when I interviewed her that day, I wanted to know if Jackson Pollock had been interested in Kandinsky, and if he had any books from the Museum of Non-Objective Painting when he worked there. That was the precursor of the Guggenheim Museum where Pollock worked in the basement on frames and such, and there were lots of Kandinsky's. And she said, well, I don't know, but you can come out next summer and visit me in the springs and see for yourself. So that's what I did. And I said, but I'm going first to Europe to interview Peggy Guggenheim about Pollock. And she didn't get along with Peggy at all, but she didn't let on then. And so I went out and she invited me to stay in the house and I researched in the library. When I got out there, I looked around me and there were so many of her, it was all her paintings, nobody else's, no Pollock's. And I'm thinking, wow, she's really good. How come I haven't heard more about her? And this, of course, might have been her plan because it turned out when I was researching the biography that all along she'd had a written inventory made years earlier of the books in the library in Springs. So she could have just said, here, have a look for yourself, but she didn't, she invited me out. 
where I got to see her work and got to know her. And she could never have imagined that I would turn up five years later to be a curator at the Whitney Museum and able to co-organize with another museum a show called Abstract Expressionism, The Formative Years, in which I would put her work in the show and write about her in the catalog. And um, although my colleague uh, was happy to have her in the show, um, it was my idea to put in her work done when she was a student with Hans Hoffmann. And uh, she said, why do you want to put in that student work? And I said, because I want to show that you were abstract and modernist before you were with Pollock. Trust me, Lee, it's really important. Do her credit, she did. And the critics picked up on her in that show and pronounced that she was indeed a first generation abstract expressionist. But all of the older critics didn't want to let her into the pantheon. So a few of them are still putting up a fuss. But we know, um, at least I think we know, I know that she belongs. So uh, I was going to tell you that I was in my home that I ended up buying out in Springs. Um, I used to have a home out there, I don't anymore. Um, but I'm still on Eastern Long Island. But anyway, I had a house kind of around the corner, up the street and around the corner from where I'd visited Krasner. And I got it five years after her death. So I had very happy memories. And um, I had a dream when I was there. I was actually asleep next to my husband. I never have dreams like this. I almost never remember my dreams. But in this dream, there was a great thud. And through the curtain, like an Edward Hopper, etching evening wind, the lace curtain we had was blowing in the second floor window and in slipped a figure with a great thud, dressed in white, comes over, grabs me by the shoulder, shakes me and says, Gail, wake up, wake up. Why aren't you writing about me? Why aren't you correcting all these lies? So um, I got the idea that Krasner wanted me to write her biography and I thought, I can't do this. This is one of the reasons I thought I can't do this. This is her painting, I love it, from 1957 called Listen, but how do you interpret it? Especially when she said, I can remember when I was painting Listen, which is so high keyed in color. I've seen it many times since and it looks like such a happy painting. I can remember when I was painting it, I almost didn't see it because tears were literally pouring down. So here she tells us that her Seemingly happy paintings were painted in a moment of great sadness and tragedy. This is in fact just the year following Pollock's death that August 1956. And it's not surprising that she was feeling very sad, very bereft. But um, in a sense, maybe the colors are reaffirmation of life and that she was going to go on and go on painting because for her that was life. She's not the only painter for whom painting or light is the life, life force, um, but it certainly was true for her. Nature, um, which we can also see in this painting, is very central to Krasner's work. But having written a biography, of, and I was writing the biography of Edward Hopper at the time I had the dream, and his work is so figurative, it's so easy to interpret. You, you don't have to imagine if there's a man or a woman's body, you can just see it. So this was a greater challenge, um, but one that I think was a very rewarding one. And <clears throat> then just to show you two more paintings, um, two, oh, thank you. Two more artworks from the same period. Um, yeah. Oh, are they both uh, bubbly? Oh, no, they're just... They're uh, thank you, okay. Um, sorry, two more artworks from the same period, uh, a collage from a great show that she had in 1955 called Bald Eagle. Now she never, you know, decided I'm going to paint a picture of a bald eagle. She simply assigned titles after the work was finished and you can see why she would decide to call this Bald Eagle and she's using scraps from both her work and Pollock's work here, dis discards. Uh, there's a whole story in the biography about how she came to do collage, but in, in, in any event, she didn't name all her paintings herself. That's another problem. Sometimes the painting names are by her, and sometimes they're not. So they are they clues to the meaning, or aren't they? 
But they basically are clues, because even if someone else helped her name it, she rejected a lot of the names, and we have evidence of that. One dealer from Detroit sent her all these titles for the works that were going to be in her show, and she rejected most of them. So we know that even though she took suggestions, she didn't accept everything. Now this painting on the right, um, three and two, in 1956, when Pollock died, Krasner was in Europe, and she had gone to Europe because she wanted Pollock to go with her. He didn't, and then she wanted him to make up his mind whether he was going to stay in the marriage or stay with the woman he was having an affair with, Ruth Kliegman, who died recently and wrote a memoir called Love Affair. And um, I think that this is influenced by Matisse's bathers. That's not so unusual to say that. But you can see forms of human figures here. And three and two, I think the twosome, the dyad of Pollock and Krasner, was interfered with by a third wheel, Ruth Kliegman. I think that's what this painting is about. But can I prove it? No. So this is the issue in writing a biography of an abstract artist. Well, to give you an idea of Krasner's background, she, and I have to keep an eye on time, she um, comes from, well, her she's born in Brooklyn, in Brownsville, then the family moved to East New York, uh, not so far from here. But the parents came from um, what was the Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire and is today the Ukraine, right where that little asterisk is, right here, Shpikov. Um, a small town known as a shtetl, which actually um, they had to flee pogroms, a government-sponsored attacks on Jews. So many, many Jews uh, immigrated to the United States from the 1890s into well, until the immigration quota in 1924. Uh, this is the family before Krasner was born, Anna and Joseph Krasner, her older brother Irving, and her sisters, three surviving sisters. One died as a child in uh, Ukraine. And these are my photographs taken last summer while visiting Shpikov. Uh, I just had to see it, and the, there's still Jews living there. There's still somebody named Krasner in the town, and it's written in Slavic with the double S, which is how they spelled it when the family first came. And Lee, in fact, was spelling it that way until she changed it later in life. And there's still a Jewish cemetery. And you can see it's not in too bad a shape compared to others in Ukraine. And while I was there, I went to visit Tarnovka, my great-grandparent shtetl, which is very close as the crow flies to Shpikov, Krasner's family shtetl. So I found out why she reminded me of my grandmother so much. This is Lee, the older of the two children, with her younger sister, Ruth. They were both born in Brooklyn and both spoke mainly English, although the family spoke Russian and Yiddish. She could understand a little Yiddish, never really learned Russian. Languages were not her forte. She loved to hear Joseph, her father, tell her stories. She said they were marvelous tales about forests, beautiful stories, always like grim, scary things. And she was afraid of sort of the unknown ever since she was a child. We don't know what happened. Her older brother, Irving, was very doting as an older brother. Now, if you read the Pollock biography, you read that um, he didn't like her at all, but I say hokum. Um, the source for that was her younger sister, Ruth, who was very jealous. And she survived Lee Krasner so she could tell any story she wanted. Ask yourselves, have you ever known a jealous sibling? Um, or been one? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Irving used to read to Lee. Her name was Lena, her given name. So, um, so she was Lena Krasner with two S's. And uh, he used to read the great Russian author, Son Dostoevsky, to Turgenev. And an, she remembered this and spoke about it. And, an, and an, um, I interviewed a lot of surviving family members, including um, two, three of her favorite nieces, um, one of whom has since died. Uh, another Brooklynite, maybe. Some of you knew Rusty Kanakogi, uh, who became uh, an Olympic, uh, well, a, a judo star and attributed um, great influence to her Aunt Lee. Anyway, another 
author that uh, Irving read to her was um, the Belgian poet and playwright um, and essayist Maurice Materlink. And uh, he wrote the famous play, The Blue Bird, and lots of nature studies. And I think that her engagement with nature certainly, and she spoke about flowers that she loved as a child, and those are exactly the ones Materlink wrote about. And she said that when she grew up in East New York, it was rural in those days. And she spoke of going to this uh, farm, which I even found, this Dutch farm, to bring home a pail of milk for her family which she didn't like, but they did, so she went and got it. Anyway, this is her um, wonderful large canvas, bigger than the screen, Right Bird, Left Bird from 1962, and a, another one of those collages related to the bald eagle I showed you called Bird Talk of the same year, 1955. I'm not going to go into it here, but there's also evidence that Krasner was dyslexic, which wasn't even known back then, but she Lo was very intellectual, loved to be read to, including by me, but by many of her friends, or all of her friends, anyone that would. Um, and she really couldn't deal with driving. She had she learned late and gave it up. There are lots. She had left-right confusion, which is common to dyslexics. So right bird, left, maybe the only painting about it. But there's another one that reveals it. And I would like to quote. Um, she said, I would like to soar in a canvas. She told that to the Brooklyn art critic, Cindy Nimzer, feminist art critic. And today, I would like to pay homage to Cindy, I'm sorry she's not here, and to um, the late Hermine Freed. I'm going to show you a video clip of her 1972 early video interview with Krasner. And to Barbara Rose as well. I'll show you a clip from her film on Lee Krasner called Lee Krasner, The Long View. Well, Krasner's love of nature can be seen here where she allows Caw Caw, Jackson's pet crow, to land on her head in their Springs house in 19, the yard in 1947. And their dog, Jip, they had another one, Ahab. Um, this is a major painting in the Dallas Museum from 1968. It's huge, bigger than the screen, called Pollination. And Matterlink, lo and behold, wrote a whole book, very popular, translated into English called The Life of the Bee. Uh, and another one, The Life of Flowers. So pollination's very central to that. And how many of you know an artist who includes lettuce in the major statement about their art? And Matterlink had written about the, the remarkable ability of a lettuce leaf to defend itself against attacks from slugs. You can take that as a metaphor for attacks by male chauvinists. But anyway, she wrote at, at the time of her uh, retrospective at Whitechapel Art Gallery, her first retrospective exhibition in 1965, she made this statement, painting for me when it really happens is as miraculous as any natural phenomena as, say, a lettuce leaf. By happens, I mean the painting in which the inner aspect of man and his outer aspect interlock. By the way, when I first met Lee, but when I got to the gallery, the Marlboro, I was early, I sat down, the director uh, handed me this catalog with this statement from uh, the Whitechapel Art Gallery and said, here, you'd better read this, she's an artist too. So, because I was of course interviewing her about Pollock and she was as nice as she could be about it. Um, in the Bluebird, the fairy sends out two children um, uh, to look for a visionary diamond to cure her sick daughter. One turn, you see the inside of things. One more, you behold the past. Another, you behold the future. And subsequent adventures take the children in search of the bluebird to the land of memory, the palace of the night, the kingdom of the future. And we can see these themes in Krasner's mature painting. Uh, in her painting, Spring Memory, the land of memory, right? Memory of Love from 1966. And I'll let you read about who the post-Pollock lover was, a man named David Gibbs, but he's a very colorful character. Um, you can read about him in the book. And a night is a very central theme, Night Life, one of her little image paintings from 1947, Night Watch from 1960, lots of eyes there, whoops. Um, night Bloom and Cobalt Night from 1962. 
and night creatures. And this I couldn't resist. One of the creatures of the night on the eastern end of Long Island is, of course, the great horned owl. And I see the owl eyes in Krasner's painting. I don't know if she put them there intentionally or afterwards she saw they were there and said night creatures. And her engagement with time is very important. With the future, she had this painting on the easel when she left for Europe, and it's called Prophecy, and it is figurative. Uh, it was very disturbing to her. She saw the, the eye on the black upper right corner, and kind of like the evil eye, and there she is right after Pollock's death when she's returned to find she'd left that painting on her easel, and it's right here in this photograph. Also, in her 1977 show, um, 11 Ways to Use the Words to See, she dealt with um, past, present, and future, as in Future Perfect, the one on the bottom from 1976. And this is a, a, a one, there's a really fun story about her running into the, or the young artist Deborah Cass running into Krasner at that show and their little encounter, which Deborah related to me and is in the book. This, if we take Lee back to her childhood in PS 72 in Brooklyn, her favorite teacher was Mr. Walrath because he um, thought that it was great for the girls to play on the softball team with the boys. And she said that was my kind of uh, guy and uh, she really wanted to be a player. She wanted to be one of the boys. What she didn't like was when she went to the synagogue with her father and she was told to go upstairs to sit with the women because the men and women were so separated in the um, Orthodox synagogue. And yet she said, um, I went to the services partly because it was expected of me, but there must have been something beyond because I wasn't forced to go and my younger sister did not. Well, she and her younger sister were so different. And in previous books, it's been alleged, this is because of the younger sister, for example, that Lee refused to marry the widower of their older sister, Rose, who died suddenly, of, uh, turns out, of appendis appendicitis, and left two small girls, little nieces, a Muriel and Bernice, um, whom I was able to interview, Muriel at least. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Ruth claimed that since Lee wouldn't marry William Stein, she, uh, she had to, and she was only 14 years old. Can you imagine a cruel sister making her 14-year-old sister marry the widower? Trouble was, she was almost 19. She lied about her age. So I went and got the death certificate of the, sis, of the sister Rose and the marriage certificate of sister Ruth, and the truth comes out. So Lee just simply had other plans. Um, she was already uh, 20, and she wasn't about to marry this guy, but she was a very doting aunt as her uh, two nieces who referred to her as their other mother. And uh, Muriel told me so many stories about how great, uh, not only Aunt Lee, but they loved her boyfriend, Igor Panjahoff. It was the one that followed Jackson Park. They weren't so crazy about, but anyway. <laughs> So when she graduated, she didn't know why, but she decided she wanted to go uh, and become an artist. She already knew it at age 13, and she found the only school where you could become study art, and that was Washington Irving in Manhattan. But they were full, so she had to go to Girls High here in Brooklyn for half a year, and she was going to study law. She hated it, and lo and behold, a place opened up at Washington Irving, and the subway had just opened, so it was easy for her to get to Manhattan right on Irving Place. And uh, school's filled with murals, even today it looks just the same. And here is Lee as she was in high school. This is her on the far right with uh, her two nieces and her sister Rose and her mother. So those are the ones I'm referring to that were orphaned when the woman in the middle, Rose, passed away. And when Lee entered high school, she, Lena entered high school, she changed her name from Lena to Lenore. Now, where did she get Lenore? And she told one interviewer how much she loved reading Edgar Allan Poe at this time, and I thought, aha, uh -huh, the raven. Now, it turns out Lenore is in more poems than just the raven. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. So her name came right out of Poe. 
And she kept it as her legal name for the rest of her life, but um, she goes on to Cooper Union, and of course there's all kinds of literature you can read, feminist writing, how she had a male identity and how she changed her name to Lee to pretend that she was, um, so you couldn't tell her gender. But it turns out when she was at this all-girls, then all-girls school, Cooper Union, in the school newspaper, um, they talked about Will Lee Krasner, with two S's, Will Lee, L-E-E, -E, Krasner, put up her hair and talked about Lee Krasner's eyelashes. And uh, that was her nickname. And by 1930, in the US Census, she lists herself as Lee Krasner. And she had only, well, this was an all-girls school. Um, the boys that went there to study architecture even had a separate entrance. There was absolutely no mixing. So I don't really think she changed her name to hide her gender. It simply was a nickname, and yes, it probably became convenient. But you know, there is even a myth about Grace Hardigan changing her name. She exhibited as George, but it, it turns out that she, the, if you read the real interview where she says, the real reason I did it, I had so many gay male friends and they all had female pseudonyms, so I took George. But anyway, because nobody was really fooled, you know, artists would show up at their opening, people knew the gender of the artist. Well, uh, her, her teachers at Cooper Union were mostly male, although Ethel Traphagen, who taught costume design, which Lee studied, was uh, of course a woman and made her own school of fashion design. But Charles Hinton was impossible for Lee. He told her he was very academic and conservative. He said her work was far too messy. And she had to work in alcoves where you had to do the hands and feet in the first alcove. Then if you were good enough, you had to do the torso. And finally, if you were good enough, you got passed to the full figure. And only then could you get into life drawing and work from a live model instead of these cast of antique sculpture. She was stuck somewhere in torso. <laughs> finally, um, he said that the uh, teacher, Mr. Hinton, said to her, look, I'm sick of you, you're sick of me, I'm just passing you on. So then she got to study anatomy with Victor Perard, and he liked her so much that um, he had her do a page of hands, blocked hands, for his book, Anatomy and Drawing. This is still at Cooper Union. And Lee told me about this way back in the 70s. I went out in the used book market before the internet, found her a copy, showed it to her, I said, which one did you do? And she turned right to this. And I inscribed it to her, and it's still there at the Pollock Krasner House. So um, it's a nice memory. Uh, this is um, Krasner's self-portrait that she used. I was able to predate it two years earlier than the catalog raisonne because I got the full records at the National Academy of Design. She'd been very clear she did it in the summer before she she got more ambitious, and she applied to the National Academy of Design, got in, and uh, she wanted to get right into life class, so she did this painting out of doors where her parents had moved out to Green Lawn um, near Huntington on Long Island. She said, I nailed a mirror to a tree and spent the summer painting myself with trees showing in the background. It was difficult, the light in the mirror, the heat and the bugs. And I even found a letter where one of her nieces, Muriel, remembered seeing Aunt Lee painting this picture out of doors in Green Lawn. So that really documented it. And if you notice, she's painting with her left arm, but she was right-handed. Another example of her right-left confusion. So she's looking in a mirror, but she's confused about what she's seeing. Not her, not her identity. I, I don't really think she looks male there that's been written, but um, she was confused between right and left. Anyway, these are her parents, Anna and Joseph, out in Huntington Station, and her sister doing the laundry. There was no running water, just like in Spikov, and in the little shtetl I went from my grandparents, still no indoor running water. So this was not a hardship on Long Island, it was normal. And when the committee saw Krasner's portrait, they accused her of merely pretending to have painted it out of doors when she really had. And when people ask uh, Krasner who was she in art school with, she always named the men. And um, 
She named people like Byrus, Byron Brown, Boris Gorlick, and Ilya Bolotovsky, whose mural you see right downstairs here in the Brooklyn Museum from the Williamsburg Housing Project. Actually, Lee was in the WPA, and she was going to do an abstract mural, but the war came and ended the WPA before she got a chance to realize her mural. She did enlarge one of de Kooning's murals for the WPA after it was... Um, he was thrown off the project because he wasn't a native-born American, he wasn't an American citizen. But if you read the biography of de Kooning, you'll read a lot of nonsense, like the fact that that was in Igor Panjohov's studio, that's Lee's boyfriend that she was living with for 10 years, and um, the references to uh, Irving Sandler's interview with, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, now I'm going to forget the name. Well, anyway, with George, um, the guy that's sharing the studio, George McNeil, thank you, uh, sharing the studio with Igor. Um, George kept saying, but Igor Panjov, that was Lee Krasner's boyfriend. Anyway, in the de Kooning biography and in uh, Sandler's books, it becomes that de Kooning was in that building, which he wasn't. Krasner had his drawing because she was assigned to enlarge it and turn it into a mural. And she talked about it in interviews, but the male art historians or historians of male artists, whatever their gender, didn't bother to look at the interviews of Lee Krasner and find out that was her project. She was working on that. So what I've done in this biography is try to put Krasner back into the story where there's real evidence she belongs. And this is Igor. I know I've been talking about him without showing. And another classmate, uh, Esfir Slobodkina, who left a, a long privately published autobiography talking with disdain about how Lee Krasner, that ugly fellow student, got the best looking, best artist in the class, Igor Panchov, as her boyfriend. And the end, they were both Russian, Slobodkina and Panchov, but he went for Krasner. Krasner um, was very popular and elected the offices in art school at the National Academy of Design. Uh, Ida Mirsky painted this portrait of Lee Krasner. You know she's wearing a cross. It's in the Metropolitan Museum today and 1929, that must be uh, the cross given to her by Panjohov, who was uh, like Bolotovsky, Russian, but he was uh, very close, you'll find out. If, he's so colorful, he was, his family was very close to the Tsar. And if you um, read the story in the biography, you'll see that I couldn't have ordered up somebody better if I were a novelist or got him from Central Casting. He's absolutely amazing. And here's another portrait by Ida Mirsky, a very close friend of Krasner's, also her older sister, Kitty. This one's from 1930, when Krasner's more of a flapper at the National Academy of Design. Now, Krasner never won any prizes. Like I said, she was too messy. But the teachers used to twit um, her friend, uh, the boys, about her friend, Ida Mirsky. Better watch out for that Ida Mirsky. She'll win the Prix de Rome. But she was furious when she heard that because she knew they never gave those substantial money prizes to girls, to women. They only gave them to the boys. In fact, when her daughter, Erica, uh, studied at High School of Music and Art in New York and went to the Art Students League while she was still in high school and wanted to become a painter, her mother would have none of it. That's why we have Erica Jong, the novelist. Her mother had too much male chauvinism in art school. And Molly Fastjong, uh, Molly Jong Fast, uh, Erica's daughter, also a writer. Uh, so it was their father was a portraitist, and that was the end of the line because of the male chauvinism. Here is a portrait that Krasner, self-portrait Krasner, did in art school and gave to Ida Mirsky, her friend, who gave it to the Metropolitan Museum. And you can see it's now owned there, along with Rembrandt's Woman with a Pink, which I think was Lee's model. She's holding the little same flower and painting herself in chiaroscuro. Well, it was at the National Academy of Design that Ida and Lee, and Ida's still alive, she's 100 years old. She's mostly out of it, but when I interviewed her about Lee Krasner um, and told her I knew about the story when they wanted to paint a still life of fish. They were in a still life class, but you had to go to the basement where they kept the fish because they would stink if it was, it was cooler and they would last longer. And no women were allowed downstairs because of the possible hanky-panky. It wasn't chaperone. They went down anyway. They got suspended for several days from art school 
And I, when I asked Ida about it, she perked up and she said, that was the only time I got into trouble. But um, Lee said, you're not being allowed to paint a fish because you're a woman. It reminded me of being in the synagogue and being told to go up, not downstairs. That kind of thing still riles me and it still comes up. And I'm gonna, this is Igor with um, some of his paintings that won the prizes. He actually did win the Prix de Rome. And so he went off for a year, um, but when, they, when he came back, they moved in together. And friends recalled Lee as having the kind of animal energy and voluptuousness we later came to call sex appeal. So she may not have been a classic beauty, but she always got the, the best, smartest, the best artist and the best looking guy. And you notice that her family thought that she and Igor were married, and so did a lot of her friends. And when they applied to Yado for a, you know, a visiting uh, artist residency, uh, Lee wrote the letter in her hands, and it signed Igor and Lenore Pantikov, because the transliteration changed in 1934, but they never were married. And remember Esfa here, Slobodkina? She made this drawing. Uh, Lee Krasner astride a fighting cock. I comment on... Now here's Lee Krasner's 14th Street of 1934 and my god it reminded me so much of this Edward Hopper City Roost from 1932. Um, and of course Krasner had access to a roof on 14th Street. And Hopper's painting was at the Wren Gallery. Who'd have ever thought she'd gone there? But it was there exactly the time she painted hers. But she quickly became flatter and more modernist. And I'm comparing her Gansevoort 1 and 2 at the top from 34 and 35 to Arshil Gorky's painting from around the same time. We don't know which was first. But if you look at the lines, I don't know if you can see them very well. They're very similar in the round yellow ball and even the red line very similar to Gorky's organization. They were good friends, Krasner and Gorky, and de Kooning. And Krasner's family thought she and Igor were married, and he painted this marvelous portrait of Joseph Krasner with his Yiddish book. Um, he used to come out and visit Muriel, the niece, remembered, sitting on his knees, sipping wine, um, and that he would visit the family often, living in the house in East, in East New York. This is Igor's portrait of Lee, about, about whom Fritz Bultmann commented with Igor Lee had a sparkle and a gaiety. And then just quickly to show you uh, her painting, Bathroom Door, which was hanging in the house when I went out there, and is very Matissean um, with a view into a second space. And the figure in the bathtub, of course, reminds one of Matisse's blue nude uh, on the lower left with the arm up. And the sculpture Matisse painted so often, and the table in the foreground, also like Cezanne. And if this were the 18th century, we could think of the broken pottery, like the broken eggs in Gurr's painting in the Metropolitan Museum, which refers to the lost virginity. And although we're after the Roaring Twenties, Lee is living, quote, in sin or in a companionate marriage, which is not a real marriage, with Igor for 10 years. Also makes you think of The Bride and Bachelor by Duchamp. And <clears throat> both Igor and Lee were on the WPA, and she recalled you had to qualify for relief first. You had to prove you had no means of visible support. That's one of her paintings after Matisse. She joined the Artists' Union, which published Art Front magazine because they protected artists' rights, but they were always getting laid off. They didn't make very much money, but it was a, it was a way to survive in the Great Depression. You, there were no way artists could get jobs or sell a work of art. Simply, there wasn't collecting. Uh, maybe if you were Edward Hopper, you became famous by then, you could sell a picture. But it was even rough in the middle of the 30s for him. Uh, this is Max Spivak, who was Lee's supervisor. She was on the WPA with the art, future art critic Harold Rosenberg. Some people think she taught him everything about art. I don't think she taught him everything, but I think what he didn't learn from Lee, he learned from other female art critics with whom he had affairs. He didn't have one with Lee. Uh, here he is. He was married uh, all his life, despite being a womanizer. Um, and there he is with his... Uh, delightful daughter, and Mae Tabak, a marvelous writer that he was married to. 
And I hope you'll read about um, the backstory of his very famous, almost biblical text, American Action Painters, because you'll never read it again the same after you hear what was going on. So Lee joined the Hoffman School, as I mentioned. And I'm wondering if this is her. What do you think in the back, in profile? Yeah, I think it may be. Uh, it's a different hairdo. Uh, this is her work after seeing out the uh, Cuba, um, sorry, the Fantastic Art uh, Dada and Surrealism show at MoMA, uh, organized by Alfred Barr. And so her work is on the left, and it's clearly influenced by de Chirico's classicism. And those big eyeballs, um, oh, also, you see the little cross in the background on the horizon? I'll show you where it comes from, right out of this catalog, Fantastic Art, Dada and Surrealism. Out of, but the Fantastic Art is the Grand Ville with the little cross and the, the repeated eyes. But the big eye is also in the catalog, Odelon Redon, the eye like a strange balloon mounts toward infinity. So she was mining that exhibition. Um, Pantyoff's work, you can see what it looked like. He was once modernist. And there they are having fun on the beach. Um, in Provincetown, uh, again in Provincetown, together with Pearl Fine and George Mercer. Anyway, um, he left, but you can see where this note, which he sent her later, they got back in touch, says, to hell with Christianity. And his parents, you'll read, were so close to the Tsar, they were quite anti-Semitic. So there he is painting her father with the, holding the Yiddish, and the parents refused to meet Lee because she was Jewish. So they never got married. I think that's the reason. And there he is. He was also something of a womanizer. Um, so she instead takes up with Jackson Pollock, whom she meets uh, before Igor departs in um, 1936 at an artist union dance. She didn't know his name then, supposedly. Uh, he stepped on her feet. He was in the Sikeros workshop learning new means, which working with industrial paint, which he would later do in his famous strip paintings. Krasner did it too. And I'm going to skip ahead. I want to. They used to hang out at the jumble shop in Greenwich Village. She said you could, in, with Gorky and de Kooning, you had to believe Picasso was a god, she said, to get a seat at the table. Uh, and here you can see Krasner, de Kooning, and Gorky all in a row with their paintings. They're all very similar in the 30s. <clears throat> and this is when she's studying with Hans Hoffmann. Igor studied with Hans Hoffmann also before Krasner, and he was too avant-garde for him, but she got curious and went there. Hoffmann loved her work. He said, my god, this is so good you would never know it's by a woman. She said before you could enjoy the uh, warmth of the compliment like that, he threw on the cold water. Uh, there she is on the Hoffman Summer School in Provincetown. I don't know if you see her on the lower right, second row. And I'm going to... Uh, so we have, we have the moment when there are bread lines everywhere. It's the Great Depression. Everybody feel very hungry. They're laid off. Igor can draw like amazing representational portraits. Here's a self-portrait in one of Lee. But he leaves. His parents get entice him to leave her, to go to Florida where he can become earn money because they have no money. They, they sell their phonograph. They can't eat. They've been thrown off the WPA. Everybody got thrown off. If you'd been on 18 months, you were unemployed. And there was no other employment, no jobs at all. So he makes, he leaves in the dark of night, he leaves everything behind, he sends her this note and this drawing of himself reclining in Florida with a pelican under a palm tree. Look at the palm tree. That's Igor. But he came back, she writes meanwhile, and she moves to a smaller studio, writes from Rambo's A Season in Hell, these lines, to whom shall I hire myself out? What beast must one adore? What holy image attack? What hearts must I break? What lie must I maintain? In what blood must I walk? Um, she had actually George, I'm sorry, Byron Brown write this on her studio wall because she liked his handwriting. Um, she told me that. 
There she is at this time. She, she decides to start showing with American abstract artists, uh, with people like George L. K. Morris and Susie, Susie Froelinghausen. There were many artist couples, the so-called Park Avenue Cubists, so they weren't so chauvinistic. And that's when she meets an honorary member who arrives in New York, Pete Mondrian, with whom she went dancing. And about uh, her work, when they were showing together, he said in front of her painting, you have a strong inner rhythm, never lose it. She loved to tell that story. And um, you can see her mosaic collage, which I think is related to his Broadway Boogie Woogie. Um, Igor, though, comes back. This is uh, his portrait of Jean. Lawson, who married Fritz Bultmann, whom I interviewed. She died only a year or so, about a year ago. And uh, that's Lee's portrait, another one by Igor. And Jean said that all Igor wanted to talk about was Lee. All right? And he eventually introduced Jean to Fritz Bultmann, whom she married. And there is Lee with Fritz, talking to Fritz Bultmann at Martha Jackson's home. Um, here's another one of her pursuers, Aristodemus Caldas, another good looking guy writing to her, I hope that during the coming year, 1941, you'll descend from the ethereal cosmos into our prosaic world, Aristo. <laughs> and it's a postcard of an Aztec goddess of flowing water. So she was kind of a goddess to them. And John Graham then puts her into a show, Miss Lenora Krasner on East 9th Street, with, together with an uh, artist she says she hadn't heard of. She goes to visit him. It's Jackson Pollock that stepped on her toes a few years earlier at the Artist Union dance. And uh, he puts birth in, she puts a painting like the one on the left, but uh, already they start to become a couple and she moves in with him by 1942, but Igor comes back. And Pollock drives Igor out throwing crockery at him to get him to go, because uh, he wasn't over Lee at all, he realized what he'd given up, but Lee had moved on. And so she paints this painting, which is ahead of a rooster, um, as the sign that she's gone on, and I think the iconography, uh, a girl who went to a farm to fetch a pail of milk and whose parents had chickens on Long Island, understood that the rooster is not monogamous, but he doesn't let other roosters come to his hens. And so uh, Igor transgressed, he came back, but Pollock drove him away, and so Igor is the errant rooster and uh, she's moved on. And maybe she remembered the Lee Krasner riding a rooster. I don't know if she knew this, Baslava Kino or not, but the rooster imagery must have been, the cock imagery must have been popular then. <laughs> and uh, so there's lots more in the book, but I'll let you read it. Um, I can't, uh, of course, Pollock becomes perhaps America's greatest living painter by 1949 in Life magazine. And we know that without Lee um, Jackson Pollock, we would not know about. Um, oh, I'll just leave you her good friend Mercedes Matter uh, posed on the beach with this driftwood for her husband Herbert Matter in 1940. And it's a little, it reminds us of Stieglitz's portraits of O'Keefe. But in Harold Rosenberg's famous American action painters, he writes about a piece of wood found on the beach becomes art. Modern art does not have to be new. It only has to be new to somebody, to the last lady who found out about the driftwood. And he left diaries documenting his simultaneous affair at this moment with Mercedes Matter and Elaine de Kooning, Bill's estranged wife, uh, Willem de Kooning's estranged wife, while married to mate Natalie Tabak and father of uh, a daughter. So Lee was pretty resentful about this article. I don't think she knew the drift, well maybe she did know the Driftwood reference because this photograph turned up a copy of it in the Pollock Krasner house, but we don't know who gave it to whom, whether Herbert gave it to Pollock, I doubt it because he was a long suffering husband or whether uh, Mercedes gave it in her flirtation, which is documented to Pollock. We don't know how much more than a flirtation it was. But anyway, um, she and Jackson posed with this little Rayfield Gribbets in 1952. Uh, he turned out to become an artist. They never had any children of their own, but it's not true that Lee didn't like children. 
She just had one in Jackson, and he was more than a brood to take care of. So um, the rest is history. I hope you'll read it. Thank you very much. Oh, I could answer a couple of questions. to show, I'll show that little clip. I certainly, I didn't know if my voice would hold up and I totally forgot. I'll show you two clips. Are you conscious? This is Hermine Freed. Just as a younger artist though, and you know, the, day, the earlier days of your career, were you conscious of the fact that there was some kind of prejudicial view toward you because you were a woman? Well, uh, not in the very beginning. It seemed natural enough for me to want to major in art and stay with art. Uh, along, you know, there were, there were a series of incidents in early studies, but it never presented itself as a really serious threat. There were always other women around. I was never isolated or freakish in that sense that I was the only woman in a given situation. It was also pretty firmly established. Uh, aren't you kicking up against a blank wall insofar as the history of art has never produced great women painters? Okay, one is confronted with that, and uh, somehow or other didn't seem to stop me. I, I agree that the history of art cannot bring up uh, exa examples in the female role that can hold to the male. Nothing I can do about it. I, I proceed anyway. Mm -hmm. That was a question of social consciousness. Anyway. It's a, many, many things come into question, more than just social consciousness here. Uh, it's a whole uh, evaluation of the role of the female in all of Western thought, for heaven's sakes, Judea Christianity, her role in it. Now, I'm not, I, there's nothing I can do about those 5,000 years or so, but like I'm alive now and going about my business, so my annoyance is with the uh, not the fact that in the past it was so, but today's annoyance, uh, you know, the prejudice today, the intolerance today is something that um, one begins to lose patience with. Right, it's, it's too exactly. late, it's too late. Um, okay, now I'm, I'm gonna play another one and I have to kind of cue it up. This is from Barbara Rose's Lee Krasner, The Long View. It's also not going to be too long. So, Gail, can I ask you? Yeah, you go ahead. Talking, it's almost as if she's accepting that there are no female. Yes, artists. she felt this so is. Isn't that this is. No, 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 no. This is before she knew about feminist scholarship. Right, so, she, when now, she. Yeah, when she got ar arrested, all the artists for demonstrating during the WP, all the artists, the men artists, would give male names, and in court they'd all look around to see who was Picasso. She said, I had only the, she gave the name Mary Cassatt. She said, I only had the choice between Rosa Bonheur and Mary Cassatt. She didn't know of other artists from history. And I don't know why this is an opening. Um, uh, Oh, here. There it, there it is. Okay. I have to. I do want a gesture very different from that of any of the other. Okay. Dimension. This is Marsha Tucker. I had lots of jobs to support my art. Before WPA, I was a waitress. I had to wear silk pajamas. I remember Harold Grossenberg because he never tipped. Later, I modeled. I'll put it here. I'll put it. Did it come up? Yeah, I do. No, 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 no you don't need that. It's not on that. Pull that off. I finished with that. Yeah, I do. Where's my computer? I guess. Oh, 
Well, work, why won't it work out the drive? It will. There it is. I know. Now I want to pull it over. I don't want to play the whole thing. That was too long. That she this is, Marcia, is at Dr. ease in that her heroic show. or monumental dimension. And then it was like a contest when you were there about like who did it best. Okay. I think Barbara's going to re-release her film next fall. That's Barbara Rose, The Long View. Um, I hope you'll read the book. For those of you that want to buy it or already have it, I'll be happy to sign them now. Thank you. Thank you.